So we'll talk a little bit about the uh, technology overview, what is focused ultrasound, a little bit of the history, uh, current, current clinical applications, and where we're going to from here. What is focused ultrasound? Dr. Cassell, who was my mentor uh, in vascular neurosurgery and also in focused ultrasound, described himself as having the quote-unquote Nobel Prize winning idea and then had the realization that he wasn't the first to think about it. The idea of using uh, focused ultrasound has been around for a long time. The idea of using focused energy has been around for a long time, uh, just as we see with the burning a hole in a leaf with uh, using the sun's rays, uh, focusing energy. Uh, this concept was uh, thought of uh, for focused ultrasound in the 50s, and we'll get to that shortly. The modern technique, it's a marriage of two innovative technologies. We have uh, focused energy from the ultrasound devices that can treat tissue deeper than the body with minimal effect on the tissue on the way through. And then we're marriaging that with uh, magnetic resonance guided imaging or ultrasound guided imaging, uh, and that can help uh, guide the delivery of the treatment. So it's really the Fry brothers in the 1950s uh, that started this whole uh, um, enterprise. The so-called Fry's Monster was a uh, four-pronged ultrasonic device that had four large transducers that would focus ultrason, ultras, ultrasound energy uh, to a space uh, deep within the brain. And really from there it was Lexal in 1950 who uh, was experimenting with this, the same concept that we have uh, now you'll see with the gamma knife, we'll get to that shortly, this minimally invasive technique. The issue was getting through the skull, so they still had to do a craniotomy to then focus the ultrasound beams uh, through the skull. And so he gave up on that and uh, came up with the uh, idea of using ionizing radiation. And it was, of course, in 1967 that the uh, advent of the gamma knife really took the same principle and, and moved it in that direction using intersecting beams of radiation. People didn't give up on using uh, hyperthermia. Uh, this is an example. Uh, using uh, ultrasound uh, transducer, uh, and this was in 1991. So we've come full circle. Now we have the imaging modalities to actually see what we're doing, uh, and we can get through the skull. So we have uh, new technologies both in the imaging and also in the transducer technology. The main thing that's allowed this is the skull correction uh, with the uh, ultrasonic devices. So before the beams of the ultrasound would hit the skull, and because of the corrugations in the, in the skull, the waves would be bent off in all sorts of random directions, and so you get no focus of energy uh, to a point deeper than the skull. Uh, and now, using a CT correction algorithm, we can focus the beams of ultrasound, and they hit a spot deeper than the brain with very, very um, uh, accurate uh, accuracy, submillimeter accuracy. So why is that important? Well. If you, heat temp if you heat tissue to a temperature of 57 degrees for one second, you get thermal necrosis. It's like boiling an egg. Uh, and so we can use that to our uh, uh, advantage when we're using focused ultrasound to treat or necrose tissue deeper than the brain. So we can either uh, cook something really slow, 43 degrees for 240 minutes, or we can get something to a peak temperature in the high 50s, 57 degrees for just one second, and then that tissue is dead. Uh, it's sort of non-negotiable. Uh, so that's our goal when we're doing these lesions with focused ultrasound is to get to that high temperature in the high 50s uh, to necrose that tissue. The margins are sharp compared to even uh, stereotactic radio surgery, and this has been shown in uh, swine studies as well um, by Dr. Elias at UVA, that the drop-off of energy is extremely sharp when you uh, compare it to radiation treatments. So the advantages versus radiation, it's a single treatment. Uh, you get immediate effect. You can see what you're doing on uh, MRI while you're doing it. Patients awake. There's no cumulative dose effect. You can go back time and time again, uh, whereas you can't do that with radiation. Uh, and we don't get secondary tumors from using ultrasound. So the brain indications that have been uh, put out there as potential, uh, you can see uh, there's a whole laundry list of things that we could potentially use this technology for, and we'll get to some of the current applications shortly. Uh, but there's a range of things that we can do with ultrasound depending on the parameters that we use. So the current state of clinical applications in December of uh, 2010, uh, Dr. Jean Minaud and Ernst Martin uh, in Zurich treated patients with uh, chronic pain syndromes doing uh, thalamotomies. Uh, and you can see here, this is a similar device that they had. It was a proto prototype device. Uh, a Lexal type frame or CRW frame is attached to the skull uh, to immobilize the patient. 
and then this uh, kind of a wok-like device is uh, put round the head. It has over a thousand ultrasound beams that focus uh, to deep within the brain. And there's a water bath that goes over the patient's scalp um, to uh, conduct the uh, ultrasound energy. And what they found in that uh, study, they had excellent results. You can see the uh, spots in the thalamus from the uh, thalamotomy um, ranging in size. Uh, and uh, it was an ambulatory procedure. The patients didn't need to be put to, put to sleep um, or, uh, or have to stay in the hospital. So that led to uh, Dr. Elias's uh, pilot study um, on a central tremor. This is the device that we use at the University of Virginia, an Cytec device um, paired with a GE 3 Tesla magnet. Uh, and that's um, just a, an example of what the patients look like when they're in the machine. There's a diaphragm that has the water in it there, uh, and that stops the, the water from falling out on the patient. And it gives a medium for the ultrasound to travel from the transducer through the water uh, and onto the patient's scalp. Uh, the water has to be degassed to get rid of all the air bubbles that we see um, in regular water. So what happened? Well, we had a pilot study uh, that we did uh, with a one-year follow-up, and that had excellent results. You can see the uh, spot in the VIM nucleus of the thalamus uh, on the left side of this patient. Uh, and you can see how the lesion changes over time. Initially, there's some swelling and edema around the lesion, and then over time, that spot uh, decreases uh, on the flare imaging. Clinically, this is what we uh, did with the patients, both uh, intraoperatively and postoperatively. So they have a preoperative test where they have to do spirals, um, and then uh, they do this while in the magnet, and this is uh, what we use to, to figure out whether we've got adequate treatment effect. So while the patient's in the magnet awake, they uh, have a pair of prism glasses because they need to be able to see down their chest because they're lying back in the MRI. Uh, and then they do these spirals uh, and the straight lines, and that tells us whether we've got adequate treatment effect as well as the temperature uh, rise that we see uh, in the thalamus. We can monitor the temperature using MRI. And these are the clinical results, and I draw your attention to the right panel. Um, in the middle on the right is the disability score, and you can see at one year out the disability scores are extremely good. That's a dramatic quality of life improvement uh, for these patients with uh, good durability. So at Swedish, what are we doing? Um, we've got se several trials going. Uh, Dr. Gwyn was the PI, or is the PI for the um, a pivotal study, so that was a nationwide uh, pivotal FDA trial um, that um, basically went on the back of that uh, pilot study and all of those patients have been treated uh, and the results of that trial will be uh, released shortly, um, I believe at the, at the next AANS meeting. Uh, so we're eagerly awaiting those results. That was a, a sham controlled trial, so patients were uh, treated with shams, so they were put in the magnet. Uh, were treated, they didn't know if they were treated or not, and then at the end of the procedure they would say whether they thought they had been, um, and if they were not, they were crossed over uh, later and were treated. Um, tremor dominant Parkinson's disease, uh, uh, Dr. Gwynn's PI of that. We're also treating brain tumors with metastatic tumors, uh, and throughout the world there's other trials going on with uh, Toronto. They've successfully opened the blood-brain barrier um, in a patient with a glioma. Uh, and we're able to uh, deliver um, a contrast agent across the blood-brain barrier to very focal spots like a checkerboard uh, within the tumor before they removed it. So there's a lot of interest in that with regards to things like Alzheimer's disease, uh, potentially dropping in neurotrophic agents for uh, uh, Parkinson's disease and so forth. Uh, gliomas are still ongoing in Zurich, uh, pain treatment in, uh, in Switzerland as well. We're looking at epilepsy as well as ICH as potential targets. I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, and OCD and depression is being currently treated by Dr. Uh, Chang in Korea with good results so far. So in terms of brain tumors, uh, initially uh, RAM uh, et al. in uh, Israel treated patients with a craniectomy. Uh, but then we had this improvement in the technology, and it was Dr. Yolas, who is really the pioneer uh, with the transcranial treatment uh, of GBM. Uh, and that was really a, a feasibility uh, of using the technology to get through the skull with the early devices. Uh, as I said, we're currently in a multi-center trial for metastatic tumors, um, but we're finding it pretty hard to recruit patients for that. Uh, this is the, the one patient that we've uh, treated. Um, there was an area of, um, of regrowth of 
uh, tumor that we treated and we were able to successfully ablate that area. Um, and as I said, we're still uh, waiting on accruing more patients before we can uh, get any conclusions from that. Potential uses, this is where it gets really interesting. Um, we came up with a few ideas that we thought might be worth uh, testing out. Um, the treatment envelope of the device depends on which frequency of transducer you use. So the lower frequency you use, the less aberration there is. Uh, the current clinical system is a 650 kilohertz system, and that is a very small uh, area that you can treat, really that, that uh, red uh, circle in the middle of the brain. And that circle can be moved somewhat by moving the patient's head in the transducer, but it's still somewhat limited. With the 220 kilohertz transducer, we can pretty much reach most places in the brain. The downside of using a lower kilohertz transducer is, is concern about causing cavitation. And cavitation is the uh, rapid expansion of bubbles in the brain, and that potentially could cause a hemorrhage. Uh, and that's sort of the major concern with uh, using a lower frequency transducer. Uh, with epilepsy, there's a lot of interest in using non-invasive techniques to treat epilepsy. The failings of the ROSE trial, there was a lot of enthusiasm for using radiosurgery uh, for temporal lobe epilepsy, but it didn't really uh, take off. Um, and we've been interested in using it to uh, treat mesial temporal sclerosis. There's other targets for uh, epilepsy that would be ideal for uh, focused ultrasound, namely tuberous sclerosis with central lesions, uh, and also, in particular, hypothalamic hematoma would be uh, the perfect choice for this device because it's right in the middle of the head. Uh, and that's a kind of a, um, acoustically optimal position for focusing ultrasound beams right within the brain. So we looked at the hippocampus. Can you actually target the hippocampus with this device? Uh, and what we found is that you can get a thermal temperature rise in the uh, hippocampus that would be consistent with cell death. So we looked at that further uh, with some work here with uh, Dr. Gwyn and myself, looking at uh, performing a virtual temporal lobectomy using the clinically available 650 kilohertz system. And what we found is that it does require some strategic planning, but we can get an adequate amount of energy delivered to the mesial temporal structures to perform this uh, so-called virtual temporal lobectomy. Uh, right now, it would take a lot of time to do that because each sonication takes some time. Um, probably about 30 seconds, and then there's some time for the scalp to cool down after each sonication. So rather than uh, potentially ablating that whole volume, we may do sort of a checkerboard kind of thing uh, to interrupt all those pathways without ablating the entire volume. Uh, and that was published in the journal about two weeks ago. With uh, CSF uh, diversion, um, Sometimes we see cystic uh, lesions like this, uh, and you think, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could just pop that cyst into the ventricle? Uh, and so the potential there is to, to deliberately create a cavitating lesion or a, sort of an explosion of cells uh, to basically blow a hole in that uh, region. Um, similarly, with a septum pellucidotomy, uh, that could be done with focused ultrasound. Uh, or even rather than doing an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, we looked at doing a uh, focused ultrasound ventriculostomy. And again, this is an ideal kind of case. Um, with one 20-second sonication, you could um, blow a hole in the bottom of the third ventricle without uh, any deposition of energy to any surrounding structures. And because it's MRI-guided, it's exquisitely accurate. Uh, so potentially, that's an operation that um, would be uh, well-suited to this technology. We looked at trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, Lexel was interested in this, so again, we've kind of come full circle with that. Uh, could we actually treat the trigeminal nerve by heating it up uh, enough to sort of decommission the pain fibers, because they're the ones that get knocked off first in terms of temperature? Um, what we found is that if we did want to do that, we had to block some critical structures. With ultrasound, it doesn't stop uh, at the target. There's energy that gets deposited in the, in the shadow of, of the target. And that's important because with things like the petrous bone, you've got the hearing and facial nerves. And so we don't want to have energy being deposited into the petrous bone and heating up the, t the petrous bone. So what we can do, similar to the radi radiation oncologist blocking out areas when they uh, do gamma knife, what we can do is actually block out the petrous bone and say, I don't want to have any energy getting deposited at the petrous bone. I want you to use all the other beams that we have available of this thousand beam helmet to just shoot at the angles that miss the petrous. And that's what that, uh, that red circle, that shows that and you can see there's sort of a black area in the bottom. 
those are the elements that have been turned off and so we don't actually hit the petrous bone and when we do that what we find is we can really decrease the collateral heating uh, in the skull base from 11 degrees to about 7 degrees which we think would be tolerable for the nerve over a short sonication in terms of the hearing. We looked at doing anterior cingulotomy uh, for uh, psychiatric treatment so that's been looked at for OCD uh, and depression that looks like it's feasible. Um, Dr. Chang has been using the anterior limb of internal capsule with, um, with good results for both depression uh, and OCD in, uh, in South Korea. Interestingly, um, one of the other things that we can do using this cavitation technique for uh, focused ultrasound is sonothrombolysis. So by agitating uh, blood clots with ultrasound, it's kind of like just hitting, hitting them gently, uh, they can dissolve. So what we found is that when we created a model of uh, intracerebral hemorrhage in uh, cadavers, you can see there's a uh, sort of a marble that's one shot from a 30 second sonication uh, in, for intraventricular hemorrhage. So we can, with exquisite accuracy, basically shoot a hole in um, blood clots. And so the idea was, well, if someone comes in with intracerebral hemorrhage, we can liquefy the blood clot uh, do it in the MRI scanner, completely liquefy the clot, and then put a little stylet in and just drain it. Um, so what we did is created a blood clot in the cadaver, uh, and then we sonicated it. You can see the T2 signal change when the clot's liquefied, similarly here and here, and here and here. And once it's liquefied, then we just basically put in a needle through a, a three millimeter uh, stylet uh, or two millimeter stylet, and you can just aspirate the clot out like a chronic subdural. Uh, and the post op uh, in these cadavers looks pretty good. So just to, to wrap up, uh, it's a rapidly evolving field. There's a exciting technology which is uh, changing all the time. Uh, every year that transducers get better, every year our MRI sequences get better in relation to the coils that go on uh, the uh, ultrasound transducer and help us see things better than uh, the year before. There's a lot of research going on both uh, here at Swedish and uh, around the country and around the world. Uh, and every year we're getting one more trial through the FDA to, to get things rolling. So we're very excited about it here. In the interest of time, we'll wrap up there, I think. All right. <laughs>